Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie Mallon, Head of Public and Capital Markets at Lion Tree. As many of you know, I spend a lot of time following and thinking about sector themes, and we publish a weekly top themes update along these lines. I'm very excited that it is also the time of year for our annual Outlook podcast, but we're doing it a bit different than years past. This year, I'm focusing on perspectives from a few of our senior bankers from across the firm to drill down on some of LionTree's key sector verticals for 2024. This is not inclusive of all of our focus areas, but we'll have some additional conversations at a later date to cover those. For today, I'm thrilled to be joined by LionTree leaders James Lindsay and Alex Michael, who co-head LionTree's growth business, and Jake Donovan, who is president of LionTree's European business, to get their perspectives on the music and sports industries, as well as the ever-evolving European TNT market. I hope you enjoy the discussion. First up, we're excited to welcome Lion Tree's resident music expert, James Lindsay, to discuss his perspectives on the audio and music industries. Hey, Leslie. Great to see you, as always. Um, it's nice to have you back in the New York office. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. And uh, this is uh, talking to Leslie and talking about music is two of my favorite things. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So I'm going to focus um, our discussion on three uh, topical areas today. So one, the changing economics of the music industry, um, AI in music, a lot of discussion on that, and M&A expectations. So um, if okay with you, we'll just jump right in, okay? Sounds good. Excellent. So first, just starting with the changing economics in the music industry. I think it's pretty clear that the current streaming music model um, needs to be reimagined. Um, the big labels in 2023 really stepped up the narrative on more artist-centric streaming models, arguing that every stream is not created equally. There should be differentiation in economics. And, you know, Deezer was the first one really to come to an agreement with UMG, you know, which better align royalties with artists that are creating value versus all the noise that's on the platform and Warner Music Group, um, you know, shortly thereafter sort of joined in as well. So not to be long-winded here, but I think this is going to be another big theme in 2024 with more of these types of deals and would love to hear your perspectives on this and how you think the deal structures are going to change over the course of the next couple of years. I think there are two trends in there that you're sort of putting together because they belong together, but they are two separate trends. One is price increases within the industry, and we've seen you know Spotify and others lead the charge on that. Um, and we'll talk about that. But then the other is, how do you split the pot, right? Which is what you referenced earlier, which has been um, described in popular culture as the sort of music versus noise debate. Um, and if we take a step back, I mean, I think one of the thematics that's played out in music is just how long the long tail is or how top heavy music is or how how much of a superstar economy it is. And Spotify that has over 10 million artists on platform, but only about a thousand or so make more than a million from royalties on Spotify annually, and only uh, 57,000 make, make over 10K, right? So I think that just shows like there are 10 million artists out there and the gross majority of them are frankly not making um, a lot of money off the platform. So this whole music versus noise seems to be going against that, right? Which is, it, it seems to be arguing well, actually, the superstars should get paid even more, right? So against that backdrop, it seems unusual. Um, and you could see, you know, a populist voice screaming out and saying, no, the, the mechanism for measuring royalties is more efficient than ever. The, the creation of music is more efficient than ever. The distribution, the marketing, why should we not pay people for what they produce? And why should we penalize? But if you look at, and if you look at the Deezer announcement when, because as you, as you said, Deezer and UMG were the sort of pioneers here. The piece that everyone fixated on was that it's only artists over a thousand streams with 500 unique listeners that get paid. But if you look at the other bullets, right, the next one is uh, boosting songs with active engagement, right? So it's songs where it's not just a sit back listen, but there's actual active engagement. I think we can agree with that, right? A song... You know, we have different emotional relationships with different songs and there are, I pay the same for every song. I mean, in theory, every song I listen to on Spotify gets paid the same, but there are some songs that truly move me and make my life better. And there are some that are just there, right? 
The next one I think is very important, which is demonetizing non-artist noise is how they described it. So you could see a place where Spotify say there are, you know, this many hours of listening, but 75% of them are noise, they're rainforest sounds, etc. So we're going to, but we're going to pay everyone equally. And you could see an artist saying, well, this is my craft and I'm getting paid the same as someone who's just recorded a bullfrog singing in a pond, right? Like that, that doesn't or, seem. Or the other night I had white noise, white noise music on all night. Yeah. Same I concept. mean, I will often put white noise on or AI generated soundscapes, right? This company called Endel that um, produces these um, soundscapes for reading or focus or listening. And the reality is I, I dedicate a, a large chunk of my listening hours to that kind of noise. And I could see, I can see the argument why an artist that truly moves me should get paid more per minute than that kind of um, music. And, and it comes back to AI, right? And you referenced AI at the beginning. And for me, the big question is, um, who owns the AI capabilities? Because in a world where a distributor, a DSP, can use AI to modify tracks and reissue them, or to create background noise, and then they look at the listening hours and they say, well, of the 100 hours that have been listened to on platform, 75 of them are sounds that we have created ourselves, whether it's through AI, white noise, or through um, basically taking existing tracks and modifying them and re-releasing them, um, you, you, you start to run into a, a bit of a tension, right? And that's where it's going to play out. And I think the reason why this has really come to a head right now is because of AI. Um, and, you know, Music Business Worldwide record, reported last week or the week before that there are over a million tracks on streaming um, services that they would describe as fraudulent. And by that, they mean someone has taken a track and sped it up, slowed it down, made modifications of that type, and then reissued it to the streaming platform as a new track, right? So obviously technology will sort through that, but the, you know, that, that is another part of the problem. And these are references fraud as a reason for their new deal. Right, right. So at the end of the day, the restructuring of these um, these agreements, who do you see as the winner? Is it the label? Is it the artist? Is it the DSP? But who's who's who ultimately is the winner here? The tension is between the label and the DSP, and the artist sort of comes along for the ride. It it is really about the labels defending their ground, which is also the artist ground. They are fully aligned there um, against the DSPs because of the fear that the DSPs will have the power technologically to create a lot of audio and a lot of listening that is not artist centric. Um, and that is fundamentally problematic for an industry where already a lot of artists aren't you know, making a lot of money from recorded music and having to rely on all the other ways of monetizing their fan base um, to to make a living. Maybe touching on the the price increase, which you mentioned. I mean, there have been price increases across you know, all the the platforms last year, and and they've also signaled that we may be seeing more in twenty twenty four. Um, what's your view on that? Do you think consumers can absorb more price increases for music streaming? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty bullish on that. And look, first of all, I come from a position of extreme bias where music is very, very important to me. If you were to tell me, you, you know, we're going to play a game where we cancel each one of your subscriptions, you know, one by one, first to cancel is gym, don't need that. Second to cancel is video streaming. The, the one that I really fight to the bitter end is music. And, and, I, and I actually think a lot of people feel that way. But if you think about the fact that video streaming services charge you more generally than music streaming, which we've come, we've got comfortable with because video is more expensive to produce should than that, audio. But should like, that be the case in your mind though? How do you, relative to video, where would you peg music streaming? I think music is more important to people than video. Um, I think the way music streaming services work, 
you only need one. Whereas on video, you need multiple, right? So if I look at it, I care so much more about music than I do about video. Yet I spend significantly less on music than I do on video streaming because on video streaming, uh, you know, I need to have five subscriptions to be able to watch the shows that everyone's talking about. Whereas music, it's a different model, right? Like most platforms have pretty much everything. Yeah, one other concept um, just to mention is, you know, I think from a price optimization standpoint, we may be seeing more on that front. You know, um, Warner Music CEO Robert Kinsole mentioned, you know, or highlighted on his call, you know, sort of assessing the relationship between, say, a family plan or an individual plan, and is that the right ratio? Or even in China, there aren't family plans yet. So it still seems there's a lot of room just to optimize the pricing models in general. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with that. I think optimization of the pricing plan. And also, music is one of the areas where people have tried to experiment with exclusive early access. Um, and, you know, Tidal tried to do that with not a lot of success. Um, but what what is clear is leading artists can do that. Um, so, for instance, Taylor Swift will release an album to streaming a week or two after she releases it for sale, knowing that her most rabid fans will show up and buy it because they can't wait the extra week or two before it shows up on streaming, which I think is, which I think is very intelligent. And I think that that sort of comes to the same point you're making. Um, but, you know, fundamentally to answer your question, I do think there is definitely scope to increase pricing, especially in developed markets where you know, streaming penetration is, 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 you know, pretty high. Moving on to um, second topic, which would be around AI. And you did touch on this just a moment ago, but there have been some big battles um, regarding the use of AI in music, which include UMG and other music publishers, their recent lawsuit against Anthropic, as well as the artist, artist public backlash against the creation right, of um, AI-generated songs. But at the same time, music companies are using AI to improve efficiencies. So ultimately, what is your view on the role AI is going to play in music? And will it be friend or will it be foe to the industry? I think it'll be both. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you and your in your question have, have touched on that, right? Like, Clearly, when someone is using AI to impersonate an artist and create music in their style, to me at least, that's that's clear copyright infringement, and that's not okay. Um, and I think there's been a lot of noise around that. And there's been a lot of press coverage around that. I just don't think that's where AI is going to go. What I do think AI can do is make the music um, production process a lot more efficient. And I've been privileged enough to see uh, demos of people putting a track or composing a track, putting it into uh, an AI engine and then just playing around with it, right? And like changing it into a different key, speeding it up, slowing it down, changing the instrumentation. I think that's the kind of thing that can happen quite quickly. And, you know, to give a very nerdy example, right? Like there was a time when people did our job without Excel, and they had to do all the calculations and all the spreadsheets by hand. And what that meant was, you're basically like, there's one case, we're going to run one case, and let's hope it's the right case. Now, I have the flexibility to run hundreds of scenarios and sensitivities and play around and like optimize. Um, so I think AI will do that for the music industry where it'll allow people and let's be honest, the music industry has already had a lot of technological disruptions. This one is not that different. It's different in terms of its scope and scale, but it's the same sort of linear progression. Um, so I think we will see that. And what's, what's again, going to be interesting to me is who owns the economics of that? Because right now, when Beyonce puts out a track, I'm listening to that track because of Beyonce and Beyonce alone. But she's sharing credit for that track with 30 musical creators, some of whom are true geniuses and deserve to get credit. But then there are a lot of like intermediary stages that you could argue AI could do, right? And then the question is, who gets that, who gets that delta, right? Like does Beyonce show up and say, well, actually I'm the one who's driving the sale and I now don't need 
a mixer and a producer and a sound engineer and blah, blah, blah. I can have one person and a computer. Um, so I should get, instead of getting 50% of the royalty cut, I should get 75% of the royalty cut. That, that'll be an interesting thing. And I, I, I don't think we've seen how that's going to play out. My hope is that the labels build that infrastructure so they can continue to be at the forefront of serving their artists so that, um, you know, artists can truly get all the benefits of, um, of, of AI. And then economically that gets, that gets spread between the label and the artist. Aside from production, are there any other large bucket areas for, um, efficiency in the process via AI? AI, again is a term that a lot of people use without really understanding it. Um, and, you know, AI on some level is just about very, very advanced data analytics um, and spotting trends in a way that, you know, previously we couldn't do. Um, and there is a lot of data on music consumption out there. Um, and over time, that data could be optimized. So you can get really good and actionable insights on what kind of music you should be producing, um, who you should be collaborating with, where you should release your music, where you should tour, right? Like where are you going to get the, the most engagement if you go on a, on a live tour? So I think there are a lot of things that could be very valuable to artists beyond just the actual production of the music, just in terms of helping direct them that um that, that are worth thinking about and then the other piece that i know um, a lot of people in the music industry are thinking about is how do you use ai as a tool to increase engagement between fan and artist right because you know i can see a world where i can say well i love this artist but i want um i want this kind of music or you know, I think about it in a fitness realm, right? Being like, oh, I want to go for a run for half an hour and I want, uh, you know, this is the speed I run at. This is the cadence that I run at. And these are the artists I like. Produce me a, produce me a you know, running playlist that's going to optimize my running. Same for meditation, same for everything else. So I think there is a way to deepen that relationship between the artist and, and, the, uh, and the fan. AI. So wanted to now move on to our last theme around M&A, which uh, is also area of expertise for you as an M&A banker. But um, the, the low interest rate environment obviously played a very big role on the escalation of valuation across music. We've seen the majors snapping up independence. Um, you advised um, WMG on one of those deals uh, in that area not too long ago. Um, but what do you think's in store for 2024? You know, especially since all this changed on the interest rate front, but the secular trends still necessitate scale. So, what's your view and prognosis for uh, M&A activity in the sector this year? First of all, the in the catalog landscape, there have been a lot of new entrants into the catalog landscape that have driven up prices, and it, as you correctly point out, a lot of that is driven by uh, the real estate environment and looking for yield where you know it was sort of in a world where it was hard to find yield. We we live in a world now where that's no longer the case. So um, you know we've seen some of those people retrench. We've seen some of those catalogs now sort of gearing up to come to market and be sold. Um, so I think we'll see a balancing out in the catalog landscape. And what already came to light last year was that the play of just buying catalog and owning catalog was not good enough. You know, you can't just buy it as a financial asset anymore. You need to go out there and optimize, you know, how you market that catalog, right? And, um, you know, uh, variety reported on Robert Kinsel's letter mapping out the next 10 years. And he makes exactly that point. He's like, if we're going to be in the catalog game, we need to market our catalog. We need to put the same energy we put against our front line against our catalog. So I think that dynamic is going to mean that it's a game that not everyone can play because not everyone has those capabilities. So it'll, you'll end up having a rationalization where some people will sell out of that world. And, you know, I think there'll be less players, um, playing the catalog game. And then, you know, the other trend I look at in M&A is um, particularly around the majors, right? There, there is a narrative in the music industry of like, oh, the majors aren't what they used to be. We don't, we don't need them anymore because people can create music 
easily. They can market music themselves. They can distribute it themselves. They can plug it in. You know, I think it's naive to count the majors out um, because, um, you know, they still they still have an, an edge. Um, but importantly, I think the majors recognize um, that they need to capitalize on their strength to stay ahead, um, right? And if you go back to the variety piece on Kinsel's 10-year plan, he talks about that. He, he says, strength and marketing of artists, songs, and albums, right? And that's, you could say, pretty obvious. But the next piece is what really piqued my interest, which is into a sustained competitive advantage, right? So it's about creating capabilities at the labels that give you a sustained competitive advantage. And in this technologically fluid world, I think a lot of that is going to have to come through M&A, right? Because there are people out there who are innovating in terms of music creation, in terms of royalty recognition, in terms of fan engagement, and all those capabilities need to exist at scale for them to work. So all these startups that are developing really compelling technology, my view at least is that they eventually belong under the umbrella of a major so that they can be, you know, disseminated across a broad ecosystem. So I think that's going to, we're going to see a lot of catalog M&A this year, but we're also going to see a lot of capability acquiring um, M&A and, and technology driven M&A. I did want to to round things out though with a quick lightning round for you. Uh-oh. Um, the first question I was going to ask you, actually I'm not going to ask you anymore because it's whether you were willing to pay more for music subscription. I already know the answer to that one, which is yes. Um, so three quick questions for you. One, do you think there's going to be an AI-derived megastar at some point in the future? Yes or no? Uh, yes. Okay. Best concert you've ever been to? The best concert I've ever been to uh, was actually um, Rolling Stones when I was in my early teens. Love that. Uh, last one, Taylor Swift or Beyonce? Eras or Renaissance Store? Beautiful thing about music is I don't have to pick. I, I love them both. <laughs> I love them both. Both? Okay. I'll and everyone wants, everyone wants to pit them against each other, but they're both fantastic. Thank you, James. Really appreciate the thoughts on music. So i um, looking forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you so much, Leslie. Alrighty. This was fun. Up next, we're going to shift into a conversation about the sports industry with Lion Tree's Alex Michael. Hi, Alex. How are you doing? Hi, Leslie. I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I just had a nice chat with James about the music sector and his expectations going forward. And now it's time to shift gears to the sports sector. And who better to talk to than you? Well, we'll see about that. Look forward to it. So um, so there are three areas that I wanted to touch on today. You know, one is the value of sports two, sports streaming and direct-to-consumer, and three, the evolving sports viewership and demogra demographic implications. So I hope that sounds good to you. Sounds good. Let's bang it out. Let's do it. So 2023 was a big year for sports rights and surging team valuations. You know, Sportico estimated that the global value of sport media rights rose 24% year over year to record highs. I think it was about $56 billion. Um, so as a very open-ended question to start, do you think we're, we're in a sports evaluation bubble or are the level of increases supportable and will continue? Yeah, that's a good question, Leslie. I think that you can't look at all sports as the same when answering this question. I think as we look at it at Lion Tree, there's sort of the buckets of core, at least big American sports, baseball, basketball hockey, football. We can talk about soccer a little bit and with Major League Soccer. Uh, and then there's up and coming properties of all sorts, big and small. And I think for the pinnacle sports like the NFL, really, NBA, and then somewhere baseball, NHL, I think they're in a pretty safe space as it pertains to the value of these teams. Because those team valuations have largely been underpinned by the revenue increases for these leagues and for the team revenues. And, and if you look at the valuations, the multiples by which they're valued, largely high single digits of revenue, those multiples have, have stayed fairly the same over this period. It's that you've seen such a dramatic rise in media rights. 
and thus the revenue of these enterprises has grown dramatically, and thus their enterprise value. And so someone like Steve Bobber, when he pays $2.2 billion or whatever for the Clippers several years ago, it was way out of whack where teams had been valued, but that was largely looking backwards. If you give him full credit, he was appreciative about where team revenue was going, and that was largely tied to media rights. And so it has caught up to that and surpassed it, right? We've seen trades now, a, a cluster of trades in the NBA, for example, at $4 billion. The NFL has the same phenomenon. And so I think you have to track the media rights because the media rights will tell you if this is a bubble. So far, there has been nothing that dissuades you from believing that media rights will continue, especially for that top-end marquee sports league. It's the other leagues that are each have to be treated differently as to where they are going, and will they ever see the media rights from the broadcasters in the linear world that really has underpinned that huge media right growth for the core sports. And so I kind of look at it like that. To the question of it's a bubble, I think you have to look at each sport. I think for the best and brightest of the leagues, the core ones, it's probably not, honestly, as long as you believe in the rights landscape continue to ascend, and we can talk about whether we do. But for the other ones, I think it's hard to reach, to really underwrite massive media gains given the fracturing media landscape streaming and stuff we'll talk about. You know, speaking of more premium rights, negotiations for the NBA's media rights are set to begin um, this year. And according to Forbes, the league's rights will more than double and possibly even triple from the $2.6 billion that Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery pay each year. So how much do you think the rights are most likely to go for this time around? It, it's hard to truly know, and they're going to try to split up the package, I think, in more ways than perhaps you know they have ever done before which the nfl has been an absolute master about whether it's thursday fridays new bonus thanksgiving games like i think the nba will dip into that and streaming clearly affords an opportunity to diversify how you present this content and, and the type of packages you can do so whether it's two or three times i, I think the only thing i'm i'm safe to believe in and is that it will be a market appreciation and thus, back to the first question, I think that will support some of these big values uh, that we're seeing in recent team deals, although you've seen some sellers, which, you know, these are informed people, Mark Cuban, Mark Lazar come to mind in particular. Are they seeing any cracks in that rights increase? I'm not sure. I think there's some specifics to their uh, individual cases that led them to just make this deal happen at these values, which is enormous value. But regardless, I, I think the rights will have a profound increase. And, you know, Leslie, this will be the last major rights package. And we just saw some WWE news today. But this will be the, light, the last major rights package of one of these premier sporting leagues for a while. Not talking about local stuff, but, but true national all-encompassing rights deals. So we won't know the bubble question to a certain extent. I think until we see what happens in five years when another raft of rights is up, but this will be the last one of real significance. And I, I expect it to be a profound step up as just Big mentioned. Big magnitude increase. Yeah. Um, and and who, do you, who do you think would be the most likely winning bidder for these this asset? I think it's impossible to handicap. I think if I'm the NBA, I want to have a lot of winners. I think you have to serve and I think we'll get into it with the demographics question. I think you have to find the audience where they are increasingly and, and make it um, as easy as possible to consume this content, especially regular season content. I think you do have overall a kind of Goldilocks for sports rights right now in terms of you still have the incumbent big legacy media guys, the Warner Brothers of the world, Comcast, et cetera. And then you have uh, a growing streaming group uh, with big pocketed tech, obviously Amazon, uh, which is uh, in the news with the recent RSN deals with Diamond. You have uh, Google now has gotten their you know feet wet with uh, Sunday Ticket, which seems to be a success. You clearly have Apple, what they did with MLS. So this is a great situation if you have premier rights. This actually feeds into my next question exactly what you mentioned it was this perfect storm that we've had with the tech players the traditional networks and you know newer players coming in and you know there's a lot of cash that's moving around but we also at the same time are seeing you know traditional broadcasts pulling back 
and being you know more focused on profitability. So will this perfect storm continue? I mean, that's a question that I would have uh, or be worried that we'd start to see less tension as it relates to some of these media rights. So, you know, would be curious to hear your perspective on the sustainability of that perfect storm, per se. Yeah, I think right now we have a situation that, you know, the cup is flowing over. You have eight to 10 legitimate bidders for these rights. And that's where we are in this moment. And that's what the NBA is operating again. So, so really this question is about in three, four, five years as this system continues to feel its way out and linear continues to erode, where are we in, in terms of that competitive tension? And I, I think it's hard not to be optimistic that there are at least, you know, a handful of players, if not more. And, you know, Leslie, you were with me when we were speaking with Ari Emanuel. He said, he went through the list, right, just as we have, and said, I don't see any of that going away. But let's say a lot of it went away. All you really need is, is his quote, you know, one uh, bitter and the perception of another. And so uh, if that's the case, we're more than okay in terms of having competitive pressure, but it's hard to imagine you don't have at least a handful, even with further consolidation in the media and tech landscape. So I think the biggest fear perhaps is that the tech guys lose their interest or they, they get what they need out of these rights on the early side and then have too much power in the ecosystem and, and then actually exert that power on the content supply. That's something I could see down the road. But you still should have other forms of media and even combatants amongst themselves at, I'd imagine, in four or five years when the next wave of rights is, that it feels pretty healthy to me. One other area, I suppose, of rights is, is more on the college side. And you know, college athletes have seen increased demand for their own call it name, image, likeness, NIL rights. And I've seen some estimates that the NIL landscape surpassed a billion in value in 2023. So um, assuming this will continue um, to expand rapidly, how will this impact the sports media industry at large? So a few things, Leslie. I, I think the college area is absolutely fascinating. It, it's a bit of a wild west now, given all the recent rule changes and the lack of really standardization across the states, uh, given there's no real governing principle of how uh, college and college athletes are being paid and treated and it, it's it's fascinating. On, on the media rights side, uh, we've obviously had big checks go to these conferences. It's led to a shifting of who's even in a conference. We all know the story pretty much of, of what's happened with the Pac-12 and its demise because essentially the, the TV dollars for the other uh, conferences and the resultant payments to the teams just became overwhelming uh, in light of the Pac-12 not having its own. Uh, version of that mega deal. And so the media rights are a dramatic part of the story in the organization of at least college football. And so that that will continue. And I think you're going to get to a point where you have further consolidation. And Leslie, this is my big kind of hot take that's that I think is a little differentiated, but you kind of see it, which is I think the biggest potential threat to the NFL is the college football game becoming the NFL. And okay. I just wow, see- Wow, we heard it here first. Okay. Right here. We did it. I think that's what I'd be scared of. There has been a hundred year detente and respect for the various worlds of college and amateur and the NFL. Literally, they built that way. That's why the NFL plays on Sunday. That's why college plays on Saturday. They very much respect and align against their individual rights and opportunities. But now that these athletes are getting paid, and this is becoming a bigger part of the university system, I do see a world where, for football at least, that these teams and these programs are carved out almost fully from these universities, or at least at arm's length, and they organize themselves as essentially a professional league, which they're really becoming. And if you look at this country, I think people don't fully appreciate that after the NFL, it's really college football as the premier content, not NBA, MLB, NHL, et cetera. It's college football in terms of rights dollars and in terms of following. And so I don't see, we're already playing with the limits of what constitutes being in college as these athletes. You have people who have played now, I think I just saw a record like ninth year of eligibility. I mean, this isn't a college endeavor in terms of a student 
pretty much anymore, especially since now people can transfer after one semester. It's not about the continuation of a college education in a certain setting. And so why not rip off every Band-Aid constituted as a mega league with the SEC and the Big Ten, get as much dollars into it, and it's capitalized externally potentially, which we've already seen some experimentation with like Florida State was entertaining this as funding the football program separately with outside capital. I just think maybe not in three years, but in 10 years, could you look up and say, well, there's the NFL and there's college football and they're actually head to head. And that rights in that pipeline of talent, actually, if, if people are making commensurate amount of the money, especially at certain positions that are uh, potentially conceived as less valuable than the NFL, like running back, that popularity at the college level may get them paid more at college and they may stick around for seven years versus go to the NFL. And so I think you're going to have that tension uh, in terms of the talent evolving into the NFL, let alone rights competition. It's a, it's a that again, that's a a very strong take. But there there's definitely going to be some friction on the edges, which you're already starting to see. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a key theme to to watch out for. Um, so let's move to um, our second topic, really on streaming and and direct to consumer for sports. Um, reach has been a key reason for sports leagues to want to distribute over broadcast networks for streaming. Um, but it was notable that two of Amazon's Thursday night football games broke into the top 100 U.S. telecasts in 2023. And at the start of this year, the NFL, for the first time ever, exclusively live stream a playoff game on Peacock. And that as well hit a new record for the most live stream event in U.S. history, um, averaging 23 million viewers. So how material do you think these streaming milestones are for sports? And do you think it'll dramatically change the trajectory of sports shifting to streaming? So I think there's there's a trade-off building in the ecosystem, right, of, of essentially reach versus rich. You know, and you're seeing this in the NBA at the local. You see teams like the Suns giving away bunny ears and antennas to do over the air because the cable system is breaking down. I think that's going to continue to be at the heart of what goes on here that, you know, our sports of the 20th century, the biggest sports boxing uh, is, a, is a quintessential example of horse racing. They made the decision to be rich and to make it narrow versus embrace TV and go broad and broad and, and be on broadcast, which the NFL did amazingly. Now, they all had reasons why they did that, which we're not going to get into here. But I think you do run a risk of these sports. Of, of closing that aperture and doing it for the biggest dollars today, but then hurting your audience and your abilities later. And I think that trade-off is really, really settling in as you talk about streaming versus broadcast, linears and a weird in between. And so we're, we're in this moment of determining what's best for the health of these sports. And I think it's not all created the same. Again, the NFL can do this. It is so sought after that people will just break through the glass to get to whatever service is offering the game. And there are not that many games and they will find it and they will consume it because it's just need to have. I'm not sure you have that reaction with virtually anything else. And so you almost have to treat NFL and maybe college football different than the other sports. But that trade-off will exist at all sorts of levels, local, national, different packages. And I think, you know, the streaming element is just becoming more and more ingrained. The pandemic was an accelerant. So the behaviors are there. People understand it. There's always a lag. But we're really getting comfortable with it. The services are going to keep consolidating. And eventually we're going to look up and streaming is going to be like cable and essentially replace it. And people will know what to do with that. And so it feels a little novel. It feels like a trade-off now, but it's it's just behavioral shifts that are already in the making and were accelerated by the pandemic. One other big area of friction of moving to streaming, um, at least from the consumer standpoint, is the fragmentation of sports across different platforms. And fans don't know where to go to see different games, and it's very ex- expensive to subscribe to all the services to watch what they want to watch. So how does the industry solve this issue, and is there a path to a more robust sports streaming bundle, which we've been talking about for some time? I think there's going to be, first of all, I think ultimately there'll be more consolidation in streaming. So the fact that there are nine services or whatever, and some have pieces of different packages, I, I think that will work its way out as the business has less and less choices and they're all aggregated within these mega tentpole services, whether it's Amazon or Max or whatever it ends up being. 
Obviously, today we're seeing different attempts at Apple trying to wrap its arms all the way around MLS is trying to solve that, right, for for the league as an apartment. This is where you go just to consume soccer content. We'll see if that's a success. We have to see if soccer content can withstand that, essentially, and not have that reach versus rich trade-off where I don't think they had that many different opportunities in terms of the media rights, but it may hurt them in the long run not to have wider uh, reach, even though we all know that Apple is is a massive, massive channel. And so I think that... Um, we're in we're in a bit of a wild west in terms of where to find the content. I think it's going to get easier. People are going to experiment. I think you're going to have a few winners, uh, and, and it'll kind of work its way out. Um, but you also have uh, trends where people don't care that much about the live games to begin with. So then it's about finding the highlights or stories about the players or documentaries. Like just the consumption pattern amongst generations is is going to change as well. And so that will play into how big a deal this fracturing of the actual live content is. And lastly on Netflix, which you mentioned, um, they've taken a bit of a, a different approach, you know, more the shows around it, the stories, the dramas, they've done quite well there, obviously with Drive to Survive and um, the Beckham docuseries. And now, as you also mentioned, today's news with WWE, um, so would you would you see this as a transition to something a bit more on the live um, side for them? I do. I see it as an absolute transition. And I think, Leslie, what's important about this WWE news and just the direction of going with live sports is that you have to appreciate, which I know you do as the master of your domain as it pertains to understanding these companies in, in the public markets, is that there is an ad opportunity here. So we, we, we need your think of Netflix, of course, as subscription, 590 and 69, whatever it's become, beloved night. But they are, of course, very focused on the ad-supported tier. And the ad-supported game is a different exercise than it is the subscription game, right? And so you need to have concurrent audiences. You need to fill inventory. And I think this live sports, as we know in the linear and broadcast world, are the number one way, uh, is the number one way, to drive that audience and to fulfill advertisers' interest. And so I think what's behind the live sports push is, in fact, this push for ad-supported business uh, for Netflix, which they see as, as really an uncapped opportunity, whereas there is some ceiling probably for the subscription world and the number of subscribers. And so this ability to have that type of content that brings everyone into the same funnel and then they can monetize not over in the subscription business, six months, nine months, whatever, people get to these streams and it's pretty asynchronous, but all at one time, they get new advertisers, they can get a premium. And I think that's why I would bet on more and more live sports on Netflix because it's essential to the ad supported tier. So I think that's that's what's really at the heart of this push and, and I see no reason why it will be. Jumping into our last uh, topic area, which more deals with viewership and demos. You know, over the last 10 years, sports fans have barely aged but TV viewers have aged by almost 15 years. Um, and so fans, and especially younger fans, are engaging in sports in different ways via highlights. You mentioned that before as one example. So how can sports evolve to capture more value from the younger demo? Yeah, I mean, you see a variety of tents. Clearly what baseball uh, did with the rules changes in order to speed up the game, right? Less time between pitches, bigger bases. Those were an attempt and appreciation that you can't stick with tradition to, to reach new audiences or have them engage more. And I think that was squarely aimed at this question, Leslie, and I think to good result if we've seen the numbers on the past baseball season. So I think there's changes you can make with the gameplay itself in order to make it more entertaining and engaging with younger audiences, which you need to do. There is clearly a graying of the core audience of the premier sports. And so gameplay changes, um, again, finding ways to connect where they are, not have them come to you, and also offer products and content that resonates. I think that's why you're seeing the Manning cast, but you'll see a whole variety of different ways to portray games in the future. You know, the Nickelodeon showing cartoons over gameplay. Like people want to consume it in a much more individualistic way than they ever have. We haven't changed the format by which we present these games in decades. And this is really all in the last few years, which streaming has enabled. And streaming will enable more breakthroughs and make it less the one to many, but perhaps the many or at least some to many that I think will 
uh, hopefully engender a new range of audiences and also taste shifts. That's why I think MLS is, is pushing on value because soccer is generally a bit of a younger sport and younger following. And some of the up and coming uh, leagues, whether it's lacrosse or ultimate fighting and pro fighting league, which you know we worked on. So I think each sport will have a different challenge, but I think it's about uh, finding the younger audience where they are and giving them content, whether it's the live gameplay or derivatives uh, in a way that resonates with them and, and finding the channels for that. So it'll be interesting, but there's no question that we are dealing with a audience crisis, I think, that will be years in the making, but has already obviously been years in the making and, and will have to be rectified somewhere. And, th and that's why we also are very intent on here at Lime Tree Youth Sports, because obviously that's the feeder to fandom and, and how the leagues interact and how the sports interact with with younger players is going to be essential. Well, that's great, Alex. I, I do really appreciate your thoughts and perspectives. But before I let you go, I have three lightning round questions for you. Okay. Um, they do all deal with sports. Okay. Um, but number one would be, uh, what is your favorite Olympic sport? S uh, for some reason, swimming's coming to mind. Okay, I, swimming. I, I wouldn't have gone there, but uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I used that. to live near Katie Ledecky. I, I just think uh, we've had some interesting characters and performances there. What sport do you do in your free time? Fantasy football. Does that count? We'll take it. <laughs> what is the last sports event that you attended? It's Formula One in Vegas. Nice. Thank you. That's a good way to end it. Thank you, Leslie. So nice seeing you. Always fun. Well, thanks very much, Alex. Take care. Bye. Next up, we're going to focus on what we can expect in the European TMT market over the next year with Lion Tree's Jake Donovan. Hi, Jake. How are you? I'm very good, Leslie. How are you? Doing well. You are last for today, but don't tell James and Alex this. I saved the best for last. So... <laughs> <laughs> we we may disprove that theory. Yeah, we've uh, we've talked about music and sports, and certainly thematically, this crosses over into Europe. But I wanted to spend some time um, delving into some key European TMT themes with you. So the three areas um, that I picked are number one, consolidation trends, and if we're on the cusp of some major deal activity. Um, the net cove or serve co trend, and lastly, areas of investor interest, including PE's focus on infra assets. So um, I think let's just get started, if that's okay. Sure. Great. Um, on, the, on the consolidation and M&A theme, it, it certainly seems like we could be on the verge of a major consolidation wave in Europe. You know, both the Vodafone Hutch deal in the UK, the Orange Mass Mobile deal in Spain have both yet to be approved. The recent offer that Iliad made to merge with the Vodafone Italia, that would make three pending deals. And Vivendi, I also uh, understand, is considering options for its stake in Tim, including a sale. So what does your crystal ball say about these deals getting done, what the regulatory, um, what the regulator is going to do, and and you know, are some more likely than others to get done, or do you think it's going to be an all or nothing um, and, and a situation at the end of the day? Obviously, as an M&A practitioner, I'm hopeful that this is the beginning of a, a tidal wave of consolidation in Europe. You know, if it were to come uh, to pass in its entirety, we would essentially be moving from largely four-player markets to largely three-player markets in wireless. That would be the ultimate conclusion of the markets that you mentioned, and then a few others that also have similar four-player attributes, such as France or or the Nordics, um, and so you know that that's the dream. Um, that being said, I've been in Europe now for more than twenty years, uh, and it's been a long-held dream that has yet to come to fruition. And if anything, what we have historically seen in the European environment is sort of a one one step forward and at least a half a step back in the sense that when regulators have approved um, consolidation, they've typically demanded a remedy package, which more or less reestablished the level of competition that was similar to that which existed prior to the consolidation. Um, so as an example, in Italy, when uh, Hutch and um, Wind uh, came together, that essentially was the reason that Iliad entered the Italian market via the remedy package that was 
uh, a condition to the approval of the of the four to three. So essentially, we went from four to three in Italy, and then back to four. Um, and that's been the the history of Europe is this um, sort of uh, focus on um, on the consumer at all costs, uh, and that that spreads across all areas of regulation, whether it be open access on fixed, which obviously doesn't exist in the U.S., uh, the MPNO regulation, number portability, um, and the remedy packages in consolidation. So it's a fairly fairly consistent theme. That being said, um, if, if we look at uh, so the glass half full uh, perspective, it does feel as if things are changing. Um, and the reason they're changing are probably at least a couple that I can think of quickly. One is the trend of convergence, whereby uh, we're, and we're largely complete in Europe, and we can talk about the parallels to the U.S. if, if interesting. Um, but in Europe, you've seen essentially in, in every market, the standalone mobile operators combined with the standalone cable or standalone fiber operators in a convergence move that essentially replicates some of the capabilities of the incumbent and then allows bundled propositions to be made to consumers. And so what we saw in some European markets is that uh, as the larger players, um, typically the top two, the incumbent and the challenge convergent operator, started to push convergence more heavily, that put pressure on the number three and four wireless only operators to a degree that the regulator felt um, that, that consolidation may be warranted. The best example of that is Holland, where we saw a remedy-free uh, consolidation approved between T-Mobile and Tele2, essentially um, because it was deemed that there was, there was sufficient competition um, from the conversion operators, Vodafone, Zigo, who would come together, and KPN, the historical converged incumbent, and so that's one one trend is is does the increase in convergence in Europe allow the regulator to consider wireless only operators at a disadvantage, and therefore um, and, uh, permit consolidation without substantial remedies. Um, and Spain's a good example of that where it's a highly convergent market. And when you look at the orange mass mobile proposed transaction, um, you could argue that there's enough convergence already in the market to uh, warrant uh, that combination to happen with limited remedies. We don't think it'll be zero remedies, but certainly limited remedies. So that's that's one thing that's happening. And then the other one, um, is around overall investment levels with 5G. Um, there has been, I think, a greater understanding by the regulator that the return on capital has declined so much as to potentially jeopardize uh, further investments, not only in 5G, but whatever may come beyond that. And I wouldn't necessarily say we're at a fa failing firm uh, uh, sort of uh, argument point, but there's no doubt that there's a greater appreciation of the potential risk of diminished return on capital, leading to reduced investment, leading to uh, reduced competitiveness of European telecoms, or particularly vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. And the consumer certainly would lose in that scenario as well. Yeah, although you know, just anecdotally, um, as a as a parent of children who. Uh, went to high school in Europe and had European mobile contracts and now go to university in the U.S., they pay more than double for the same service in the U.S. So <laughs> I don't think there's any lack of competition in Europe right now. Outside of telecom, how would you then characterize the regulatory environment in, in the U.K. and Europe heading into this year? We've seen several large transactions, namely you know, Adobe's Figma, Amazon, iRobot, um, you know, both held up by European regulatory uh, regulators uh, recently. So do you expect sort of looking outside again, these telecom markets that we just discussed, but regulators being more accommodative to deal making um, in general across Europe or in TMT more broadly? It's a good question. I mean, you know, the media space would be is an interesting one where there have been a number of attempts, notably led by Burlesman RTL, to consolidate the traditional free-to-air broadcast markets um, in Holland and in France uh, and elsewhere. Projects have been examined. 
Um, unfortunately, and, and the theory was that the the traditional definition of the broadcast uh, advertising market was too limited, recognizing the over the top uh, players and the and and the uh, direct to consumer internet. Um, unfortunately, the regulator, and this is as recent as a year or two ago, has blocked all attempts at uh, consolidation in the broadcast space, um, largely by refusal to expand the definition of the advertising market. And so they're still looking at, at smaller verticals, the, the broadcast advertising market, the radio advertising market, um, the print advertising market, as opposed to a, a view that it, what we're dealing with is something far more uh, converge, really. And the players like Facebook and Google and others have a substantial advantage, even against a combined uh, broadcast platform. So that is not very promising. Um, although, you know, hope never dies. And, and we, we certainly hope that the regulator the thinking on what the market definition will evolve. Um, and I would say there, we don't, you know, the, the, there was a view that Brexit would enable a more front-footed regulatory policy in the UK. We haven't seen that to date. I mean, if you look at the um, at the CMA rulings, if anything, the the UK regulators post Brexit have been more aggressive. Um, uh, and I don't mean aggressive in a positive sense. I mean aggressively uh, in uh, against consolidation. Than certainly than the U.S., um, but even uh, some of the European positions, and I'm, I'm thinking about micro, Microsoft Activision is probably the most notable one there. So we'll see. Um, right now, I would say it's difficult to see reasons for broader optimism outside of the wireless space. Um, but uh, you know, there is a consistent and, and active education effort underway. Um, we are living in a global marketplace um, and certainly being an outlier uh, against consolidation uh, has, has cost Europe uh, the creation of not only domestic champions, but European champions and arguably global champions. So there is a price to this position. Uh, which hopefully will be assessed as we move forward. I just want to ask one other question along uh, along these lines, and it, it's more so related to some of the geopolitical tensions that are out there, um, especially as it relates to the Middle East. But there there has been some, you know, Middle Eastern telecom companies more active um, in Europe, uh, Saudi Telecom Group, SC, STC, and UAE's e and um, both spending, um, I think it's about 5 billion euros, if I'm not mistaken, in four deals in Europe over the last year. So how do you see, um, well, I, I guess, number one, I, I'd be curious to hear your perspectives on what their investment case is, first of all, what opportunities they see. And secondly, how do you feel that some of the you know, current geopolitical um, environment um, you know, may, may impact any future levels of investment? So uh, I guess on the first point, um, there's no doubt a there has been a relative cost of capital advantage uh, coming out of the Middle East, uh, looking at any sector that has been offering yield, in particular as interest rates have gone up. So you have cash-rich sovereign wealth funds or cash-rich sovereign controlled corporates, such as the telcos you mentioned extremely low cost of capital. And historically, these groups, the diversifications they had done had been more uh, east or or south, so into Africa or or into Asia. And um, you know, I would I would argue that the the their timing um, has been relatively interesting in the sense that as uh, rates have gone up, as the cost of capital has just become more clear, They've moved into European uh, assets. Um, you know, not everything has gone smoothly. If you look at the share price development of Vodafone from the time of the original investment, um, but I, you know, in, in a long-term context and over the cycle, when you look at the valuation levels at which these these investments have been made, um, you know, there's reason to be optimistic about the future. So it's certainly a cost of capital uh, question. Um, there's a diverse risk diversification question for these groups where, as I mentioned, historically, they'd invested in higher risk markets and Europe is perceived as a lower risk uh, area. Um, 
and then there's the opportunity for synergies between the groups. So as an example, EAN and Vodafone have signed a relationship agreement that um, we'll see the two groups working together to try to optimize synergies across the platform. Um, so that sort of explains the why. Yeah, Europe, th that w when you talk about where we may go from here, um, the world is definitely a more protectionist place than it has been at previous points in the cycle. Uh, and Europe is not immune from those trends. Um, what we are seeing, nearly without exception, are investment limits um, in almost every European telco that either explicitly or implicitly uh, requ require regulatory and government approval for substantial ownership by foreign entities. So um, although we do believe that uh, Middle East and, and other capital will continue to be invested in, in European communications. Um, it's going to take time. It's going to have to be measured, and it will need to come with government approval. Um, now, frankly, that's no different from the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has always been, um, you know, taking this view on strategic sectors, and it doesn't mean that foreign investment can't happen. It just means that it has to be welcome. So. Um, I think it'll continue, but but it'll 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 be measured. Maybe moving on to number two, um, the topic of Netco and Servco. An increasing number of companies have been separating their business into Netco, or call it Infraco, Towerco, Fiberco. Yeah, sort of, which looks after the network operations and Servco, which is really servicing customers. So you know, maybe first of all. You know what has what's the rationale been driving this trend? Maybe you could just start there. So the rationale is a um, a, f a few points. One is clearly a, a perceived valuation arbitrage vis-a-vis um, -vis the public market. So essentially, the public markets are valuing aggregated uh, infrastructure assets, in this case, communications assets, at multiples that um, uh, many believe do not represent the some of the parts value that can be achieved in private markets. And so what we've seen um, in Europe, probably even more so than the U.S., but in the U.S. as well, is a steady flow of partial or complete divestitures of infrastructure assets by um, the larger integrated companies. And so this is towers, fiber, data centers, submarine cable, Etc. And the deals have either been complete divestitures, um, uh, minority stakes to highlight the value, or um, an interesting trend that's definitely taken off in Europe where we're seeing JV structures to essentially off balance sheet capex. Um, and so, so certainly when you think of what's driving the net code serve code question, it's really the same thing that's driving the infra investment wave. Um, and that's an value arbitrage. Um, and the value arbitrage, one could argue that it, it happens because the payback and duration of the investments in the infra assets is extremely long. Um, and not to criticize uh, public markets in any way, but sometimes the patience of the public markets is just not there for these long-term investments with payoffs that are not certain because the, the payoff is not necessarily a regulated guaranteed return. Um, and if and when it is regulated, regulation changes. No one, you know, you could argue that to date we haven't seen the premium pricing of um, superior technologies as they are delivered. And, and, and in fact, in Europe, in many instances, speeds and capability of product has improved, and prices remain relatively constant. So there's a, been a debate about the the, the payback of these investments. Um, but what we're what we've seen is that we've seen the private investor universe of infra funds and P willing to take that long term view and 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 have that long term belief and therefore pay values that are well in excess of what's available in the public market. And so the um, the the Neco Circo is is the most extreme example because towers, fiber, data centers, et cetera, are smaller pieces of the whole. Netco Servco is the whole. It's basically taking the entire company and breaking it, as you, as you said, into um, the infrastructure component and the uh, the customer business. And there are some flavors of Netco Servco. So, you know, some Netco Servcos uh, would argue that um, the, the RANCO within the business, so i.e. the mobile spectrum and the active mobile equipment, 
uh, belong in Netco. Others argue that it belongs in Servco. And so there's there's some debate underway as to what is the perfect model. Um, we saw in Italy this year the first large scale example um, uh, following the 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 Danish transaction years ago, whereby a private investment group um, partnering with the state is going to be buying the uh, fixed line network of Telecom Italia. Um, and the Remain Co., which will be the listed entity, will have the customers and the mobile network and obviously a deep um, wholesale relationship with, with the Netco. Have you seen data to support that this, arbit like this arbitrage has been successful or is it too early to tell? It's a good question. So there's no doubt that um, the multiples achieved for pieces for the infra, infra assets towers, fiber, uh, data center, et cetera, or that has been achieved in Italy for the Netco are superior to the um, average multiple of an incumbent. So there's no question about that. Um, a different question is where will the Servco trade over time? Um, and of course, the Italian transaction hasn't closed, but it's going to be the first example where we will have a mark to market. So Post-closure, we will have a market price for Servco, and we'll have a historical transaction price for Netco, and it will be very clear. And we can then compare that against the average incumbent multiple in Europe, and, and there'll be a very clear view as to whether there has been or hasn't been value creation. It's perhaps a little early to judge because there's still some uncertainty about closure, and there's some important um, conditions to be, to be resolved. Um, there are certainly arguments on both sides as to whether it creates value or not. Um, so I think we we should wait, look at the evidence, and uh, and then we'll have a good view. Okay, to be determined. We'll talk about that maybe next year. But <laughs> <laughs> um, you had mentioned the you know that a couple a number of telcos have created JVs um, off balance sheet um, you know, to roll out fiber, what have you. How do you see this playing out for companies over the long run? Once private equity firms need to exit, so will you see telcos relever to gain control back of the networks? How do you how do you see this um, proceeding over time? That's a good question. I mean, what we don't know is, um, at least in Europe, there was a whole wave of the mobile businesses being listed, um, and as as a carve out. Uh, and the reason they were listed was because of a perceived value arbitrage um, and to raise capital to deploy uh, uh, ever expensive evolutions of, of mobile equipment. I, you know, without exception, all of those have been undone. So, you know, whether, whether it was Telefonica Mobiles or Orange Mobile or uh, a number of other ones, they've all been undone. Um, much like in the, in the utility sector, when renewable assets were carved out, they've all been reincorporated back. So you, you, we could see that trend. We could see that the fact that the infra trend was temporary financing driven, arbitrage driven, and when the financing needs have been met and the cash flows are coming at the end, um, and there's no longer as much of a valuation arbitrage because the markets are able to value more appropriately a cash flow asset as opposed to a CapEx asset. Um, we could very well see these assets reincorporated. That, that's definitely a scenario. Whether that there's be, whether there's a transitional phase of a listing, and then a remerger, or it's a direct buyout, we'll see. Um, but we'll also have opportunities to to determine whether customer only assets can thrive. Um, and to date, we don't have a lot of examples uh, of, of of customer organizations, we had those for a while, and those were, say, an Iliad or a, or a Tele2 or others, but they actually ended up going in the infra. Um, and so whether we'll simply end back where we started, which is not unusual, um, time will tell, but but it's it hasn't been without logic. It, you, you have a massive CapEx wave um, required for fiber. The public markets are not, uh, don't have the appetite to fund it. You're finding uh, essentially cheaper capital externally to do it, and then once the journey is over and cash flow is is uh, is flowing out of those networks that have been built, um, 
they may very well be best better suited in the public markets and, and maybe reincorporated. So I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out. So just moving on to sort of our, our last theme and, and some of these overlap a little bit, but um, you know, related to the amount of capital that's been going into infrastructure. I've seen a stat that there's still about three hundred and fifty billion of dry powder for infrastructure fund managers. Um, so a lot of capital still set. So should we expect to see you know continued capital flowing very aggressively into these assets? And you know how much more of an opportunity is there um, into this asset class? Yeah, it it feels like we are. Um, there's more to come. Um, and I would argue it's not just telco. I mean, if you if you think more broadly about the state of the balance sheets of most governments in the world today. Um, it's, you could argue it's like an overlevered telco. So the government should be investing not only in, 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 in fiber and wireless, but in highways and um, energy transition and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, it could very well be that a lot of that capital will come in the form of public-private partnerships for the same reason. You're, you're essentially off balance sheet. You, know, you, take, you take the liability off balance sheet, the capex off balance sheet. Um, the, the heavy investment phase comes from external cheaper capital, uh, and then it's reincorporated later. So we we could see that, but specifically with regard to telecoms, um, I, I would say we're we're probably halfway along the journey, maybe a bit more. Um, a lot of the easier transactions have happened, but the next phase, which could be enormous, would be um, let's say an acceleration of the net cost surfo trend because that you know if you once you take it to that level we're talking billions and billions um and and another area which is which is really interesting i think is this whole ramco question so um is spectrum and mobile spectrum and, and active equipment is that an infra asset or not if it is infra asset there's an enormous uh, asset pool that could be invested in there as well um we have seen interest rates move up, and so the cost of capital event for fronts has increased somewhat. Um, so we'll see how that all shakes out. But my sense is given the dry powder, the public market valuation levels, which remain subdued, um, I think we'll see more. And I, I believe it will spread into uh, additional areas of, of end front. Last question would be... Um more around the the asset managers or infra asset managers. Just in in early January, BlackRock announced it's going to buy Global Infrastructure Partners for you know, over twelve billion, and that makes it the second largest manager of private infrastructure assets. So, is there is this another um, expected um, ripe area for M and A looking forward? See more consolidation here. Yeah, um, I I would. You obviously have to. We have to separate out the sovereign from the non-sovereign. So within the infra investor pool, there are substantial um, sort of quasi-sovereign pension fund control uh, investors. So you know the Australians or the Canadians, but um, but there's also a number of of smaller funds. And so I I would imagine that we'll see um, a continuation of the trend of either PE uh, creating infra. Or as we saw in the case of BlackRock, acquiring infra, but it feels like it's a very attractive, long-term, stable, and large asset class that any asset manager ought to have in their um, in their quiver. Well, Jake, thank you so much for your thoughts and perspectives. Sounds like there's a lot going on in Europe. Um, so Let's really appreciate so. your time. <laughs> But before I let you go, I do have a quick uh, three-question lightning round for you. Right now, one euro equals 1.09 U.S. dollar. So at the end of the year, will the euro be higher or lower uh, relative to where it is right now um, to the dollar? Lower. Okay. What is your uh, favorite country to ski in in Europe, since I know you are an avid <laughs> skier? Austria. And lastly, what is your favorite local streaming TV show? Uh, so I would call out probably two platforms more than shows, but um, there's a platform called Mubi, M-U-B-I, which is absolutely phenomenal, um, sort of long tail, very curated content um, based in London. And another one actually based in Spain called Film In, F-I-L-M-I-N. So if you're getting sick of the usual Hollywood blockbusters and looking for 
some high quality uh, exotic content. Um, I recommend both platforms. They are they're extraordinary. Excellent. I will check them out and much appreciated again. Thanks so much, Jake. Thank you for tuning in to Lion Tree's 2024 Outlook podcast as we navigate what is sure to be an exciting year. We hope these insights give you a sense of what to expect in these pivotal industries. There's more to come over the next few months, but for now, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the discussion.